This week on the Back Table Podcast. Do you feel adequately trained in end-of-life conversation? Do you feel adequately trained in how to counsel somebody on the fact that they're dying? To have a conversation with a patient to say, I'm not going to do this procedure because it is not going to help you. It is a futile procedure. Rather than just offering what I call expensive hope. We do that, right? And we do that terminal embolization or we do that terminal X, Y, or Z and the patient dies within 30 days and we look back and go, Oof, yep. that was probably not the right thing to do. So, you know, asking those questions and understanding, are we adequately preparing our future interventionalists uh, to practice this way, to answer these questions, to consent appropriately? I, I think we should focus more energy on that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. RADPAD was developed by physicians for physicians, clinically proven radiation protection during cine and digital subtraction and geography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RADPAD radiation protection shields for all your fluoro guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no brainer radiation protection cap. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on the Back Table podcast. Now, back to the episode. I'm your host, Eric Keller, and today I have the honor of interviewing Dr. Sean Tutton. So Dr. Tutton is an interventional radiologist who's actually one of only four IRs nationally that is also board certified in palliative care and hospice. He served as faculty at the Medical College of Wisconsin for 16 years and actually just recently was recruited to UCSD down in San Diego to build a palliative MSK IR program with dual appointment in IR and orthopedics following uh, or focusing on MSK intervention. So really honored to have you on the show today. And I, you know, I hope you're doing well. I really appreciate the honor. Eric, thanks for the intro. And uh, yeah, likewise, I'm, I'm super psyched to talk about palliative uh, care, palliative interventional, the space. It's something I've been very passionate about since, well, probably mid-career. Got my board certification uh, with my partner, Rob Heeb, when, when I was at MCW. Uh, I was in 2012. There was a grand, uh, grandfathering period where you could actually as a radiologist, a neurologist, or an ER doc, or some of the other disciplines, you could sit for your palliative care boards and and uh, get certified. So mm. that's kind of where it began. And what what was the what was the inspiration behind it? So it sounds like this is something that you could just sit and take the exam in that time period, rather than doing like the one year fellowship. Well, so it was a uh, you know what they were trying to do was uh, get more people into palliative care, and so they had this window of uh, or grandfather period, it, it was actually very rigorous. Uh, you ended up having to demonstrate that you'd cared for something like 50 end of life patients. Uh, we had to attend all of the palliative and hospice care, uh, didactic lectures for that year. Mm. I actually was a fellow under palliative care attendings for a while and like wrote their notes and, you know, saw the patients and had the family meetings. And mm. then you sit for the palliative care boards, which was a very difficult test, I must say. Wow. Uh, a lot of medicine, you know, a lot of uh, pharmacotherapy and, you know, opioids and interactions with some of the other medicines. But it really was a life-changing experience for me. I'm, I'm really happy I did it looking back. Mm. What, what, was your, what was your inspiration that kind of led you there, first introduced you to maybe the importance of palliative care? You know, I, I want to get through definitions too, but I'm interested in maybe we yeah. can start with your, your story and what led you there. You know, so I, uh, for a long time, have been taking care of patients that are end of life. You know, they've already got bone metastases. Uh, my area, of course, is MSK and spine interventions. So by definition, the vast majority of my patients are end of life patients that are just looking for quality of life. They're, they're looking for answers. Uh, you know, should I do this procedure? Will this help me? Uh, is this going to make a meaningful difference in my survival or in my quality of life. And I would see these patients in clinic and, and I, always, I didn't always have the answers, right? And I didn't actually know how to frame the questions and the, and the responses to what's my prognosis and how long am I going to live, doc? And all these, these things that we hear all the time when we're in clinic as IRs. 
And so I really felt a little bit inadequate in my communication skills and my knowledge base. And I wanted to learn more about that. So that's really, that was the genesis of it. You know, those difficult questions that we all face when we're sitting in a clinic uh, visit with a patient who has, you know, metastatic pancreatic cancer and they, you know, they, they want to see their daughter's wedding and walk her down the aisle. And I have a number of patients that, you know, sort of jump out where they would say, I'm having this terrible back pain and I've got this metastasis and I'm on all these terrible narcotics and I, you know, I can't think straight and I just want to see my, my daughter walk down the aisle. I just want to walk her down the aisle. And so, yeah. you know, framing those goals and, and framing that uh, sort of uh, quality of life discussion, that's, that's really what you know, sort of push me to try to get more training. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, I, I think we got talking around some of the ethics stuff that I've been doing recently. And when we surveyed right. IRs, this, this was like the number one challenging, sticky issue that people felt like that they dealt with day in and day out is yeah. how do you have these conversations? How do you navigate when you should do something? Not necessarily just because you can do something, all those sort of things. But, you know, here you are years ago that had that same response. And then when it did that extra training to feel more confident in it, which I think is is really inspiring and interesting that I think people would be really interested in hearing about. So, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I, so I think all physicians and especially physicians that do things to people, right, proceduralists, surgeons need to have this kind of training because we we offer these these glimmers of hope to patients, right? And so you come into the room and you got your white coat on and you're towering over the patient and you sit down and you say, I'm going to do this liver directed therapy, or I'm going to do this, you know, this surgery. And they are, they're hoping for the cure, right? That that's what's in their head. And they're hoping for, wow, this is going to buy me time. And this is going to be the thing that really does it. That's a awesome power that we have, right? And so we need to be really careful with that. And Really, uh, when we are consenting patients and talking about what we can and can't do, really being thoughtful about not over overstating, right, what we can do and, you know, under promise and over deliver, right? Sort of the, the adagio that we all should be using. But so to get back to the point of, you know, the training, I think anybody who has that uh, sort of role in medicine needs to have more training on how do you talk to patients? How do you frame prognosis? How do you understand a procedure that's maybe futile versus a procedure that truly is palliative and might improve a patient's quality of life and, and you know the time that they have left? Yeah, exactly. Well, let's, uh, let's walk through it then, maybe starting with some sure. uh, definitions, because I think, you know, first and foremost, getting into the word palliative care, I think palliative care and hospice gets kind of mixed together and used interchangeably. So maybe we can start with, you know, what is palliative care versus hospice versus futility versus like a palliative care physician? Like, I think it gets to be a little word soup that maybe interventional radiologists aren't necessarily yeah. comfortable with. Yeah. So, you know, if you look up hospice and palliative care, you know, there are some things that will pop out and go on there. There's actually, you know, the Association of uh, Hospice and Palliative Care Physicians and there's, there's a whole board certification and, and it's a specialty into it as part of internal medicine. You know, and sort of the mantra is, you know, to cure sometimes, to relieve often, but to comfort always, right? I mean, that's, that's the difference, right? So we're shifting away from curative intent to symptoms management and relief of symptoms. And, you know, so control of pain, you know, uh, trying to strive for the best quality of life for the patient. These are the things that palliative care physicians think about. So palliative care is really has that goal in mind. And so they're connected in the sense that often patients that benefit from palliative care who may have a terminal disease uh, or a chronic disease, at some point in the trajectory of their disease are going to become candidates for hospice. And so hospice is a, uh, is a separate entity in the sense that when you're in hospice, enrolled in hospice, which is a, you know, sort of the center for the Medicare has its own designation for hospice and it actually has its own benefit. So when you enroll in hospice, you're sort of signing on to the concept and to a contract where you're not going to pursue a lot of like life prolonging, life extending 
interventions and therapies, you're really now focusing on symptoms management and you and there's this general acknowledge, acknowledgement that you've got six months or left or less to live. Mm-hmm. And so you enter into the hospice you know benefit, uh, which is separately paid for, and that has some benefits because there's more benefits, there's more support, there's home care, um, the, the palliative medicines that we use, you know, the, the opioids and some of the other expensive therapies for relief of symptoms, those are covered by hospice. And so that's the good part of the hospice benefit. The difficult part is that if you as an interventionalist say, I want to do a celiac plexus block or a neurolysis, or I want to do this really valuable pain relieving procedure, sometimes the patient has to actually go off of drop hospice. out of go off of hospice yep. so that they can have that intervention and then re-enroll. So there's there's some rules around this that I think are actually a little complicated and get in the way sometimes of patients, you know, overall well being. Hopefully I explained that well enough. The thing that's a challenge is when you see a patient in the clinic as an interventionalist and you're talking about maybe referring them to palliative care so that they can have optimal symptoms management. You say palliative care, they hear hospice. I was just about to bring that up actually. I, I think even on the physician side, sometimes yeah, I think that, absolutely. you know, you, you get this referral and you say, you know, hey, I think that this is someone that would really benefit from getting palliative care involved. And, you know, what the sometimes what interventionalists hear is, oh, we're giving up or whatnot. Whereas I almost right. think that palliative care should be part of every tumor board in a way. Right. I mean, it yeah. should be part of that yeah. conversation. But yeah. And I think they are in some in some areas. Uh uh, at MCW and at UCSD, uh, they don't routinely participate in the tumor boards, but I, I agree with you. I think they should. They tend to be a service that's stretched pretty thin. Yeah. At uh, UCSD, uh, Anthony Tadros, who's one of my partners, he was actually one of my fellows at MCW, super guy. He, uh, on his own initiative, even before I arrived, uh, started a weekly conference with palliative care. And so just, you know, one of the things that you realize is that they are such a great resource for us as interventionalists and as people that are part of the cancer center uh, and that they're that neutral party that really is focused on the quality of life of the patient and really advocating advocating for the patient's you know best interests. And we as the surgeons, the medical oncologists, the surgical oncologists and interventional radiologists or oncologists you know, we're trying to come up with the best plan for the patient, but in a way, the palliative care doc can be this great sort of broker sometimes to say, well, hold on here. You know, maybe something less invasive would be better for this patient who only has three months to live. Yeah. Right? Well, it's like the 10,000 so, foot view in a way sometimes. Yeah. Kind of saying, you know, what, what exactly. really matters here? Where are the goals? I One of my favorite things I learned from palliative care was a saying, uh, goals before holes, which, re, which came up <laughs> on uh, Twitter recently. Yeah. And I, I'd forgotten about that, but I think that that kind of says it well, maybe from the IR side, right? Is that well, what are the goals here? So, no, I, I actually have never heard that before. I think that's awesome. That is, I am stealing that. That's, <laughs> that's going on my Twitter feed for sure. Well, it may, maybe that could be the title for the, the episode, right? <laughs> yeah. Goals before holes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that's interesting when you look at, uh, you, you were sort of talking about, you know, how palliative care physicians think and definitions. I was preparing a talk for uh, interventionalists on palliative care, palliative interventional. Actually, uh, Sarah White and I sort of shared this talk. Uh, she presented it at a meeting. I presented it at a meeting. But, you know, if you look at their kind of their mantra, relief of your symptoms and distress, help you better understand your disease and diagnosis, help clarify your treatment goals and options. Understand and support your ability to cope with your illness. Assist you in making medical decisions. Coordinate with your other doctors. So that's their mantra, but I would say that's everybody, right? That should be our mantra. Like that should always be, no matter what yep. the patient's story is, that should be it. So maybe we should talk about that then. You know, maybe let's talk about the average IR out there, not the person that's going to get double board certified in palliative care and hospice. What what is this? What is a more palliative minded or you know evidence supported approach in your opinion that, that the average person would take on? Yeah, I guess I, I don't know that I'll answer it perfectly, Eric. But 
those sort of key tenets that I just sort of outlined, that's really how I frame my discussion when I sit with a patient and I go through what I can offer them. And uh, I do an informed consent and I start talking through, this is your disease. Many of the patients that we talk to don't realize what their disease is, right? They they actually don't know they have cancer sometimes, right? That's not uncommon, (laughs) unfortunately. So, hey, you have a terminal cancer, you have metastatic disease. So really helping them understand their disease and diagnosis. And then what are your goals as a patient? And so the the interventionalists, the average interventionalist out there can really, when they're having those conversations in the clinic or they're having, you know, they go up and see the patient on the floor, you know, sitting down with a patient, which is something you learn in palliative care, don't stand and tower over the bed, sit down at the same level, get in a chair and sit down and talk to the patient, hold their hand if you can, you know, like get connected to the patient so they feel comfortable with you and really walk through, you know, this is what's going on and this is what could be done and this is what my role is as an interventionalist, um, this, these are the limitations. You know, this is what it will do. This is what it probably won't do. Yep. Right. These are, the, you know, really getting down to the nitty gritty of informed consent and, and really educating the patient. And then another thing that you learn in palliative care is ask them to repeat it back to you. Say, okay, what did I just tell you? What did you hear? You know, and if they can tell you that they have metastatic pancreatic cancer as a, as a example, and that you're going to do an ablation and a vertebral augmentation or an ablation and osteoplasty. And what's that going to do? That's, uh, I think it's a really useful skill set to kind of develop. It's like any muscle, you know, you have to kind of exercise it. Um, it's uncomfortable at first, yeah. you know, because you're, you're, it's a communication style that's a little bit different and it takes a little bit more time. But uh, I guess that that's my recommendation. I don't know if I hit your question right. No, I, I, think that's, I think that's great. I, I just think that you know, your, your average listener sometimes looking like, what, what's something practical that I can do right now? And I think even yeah. just that, right? Like you, you're meeting this person for Y90 radio embolization, third biliary right. drain, whatever it is, right? And that, you know, going in, sitting down at their level, establishing that rapport, laying it out as, as you were saying, not kind of like uh, skirting around the issue sometimes, like being afraid to say, you know, this is this is terminal cancer, right? Metastatic terminal cancer. And then assessing that understanding. I I mean, hopefully I would hope that's something that someone would do for me, you know, if it was my physician. So hopefully something that Mm -hmm. we can all do in interventional radiology, maybe something that we should, should teach more. I mean, I'm sure you teach your, your fellows that, but I'm not sure that's common across all of interventional radiology. (laughs) Yeah. So at MCW to the credit of, uh, you know, Parag Patel, and Matt Scheidt, uh, Rob Heap, uh, before them as program directors. You know, when we invested the time, Rob and I, to, to go through the uh, board certification, one of the things that we took away from it was, we've got to have our residents and fellows interface with, with this team. And so we actually have them rotate for, I think it's two weeks at MCW. Like during their last year or- you know, they yeah, spend two exactly. weeks on the palliative care service. Right. So what does that do? Well, that, that gives you that perspective, right? And you're hearing through the palliative care team's eyes and ears and, and how they're talking about the patients. It's a different way of thinking about the patients. How they think about our interventions is different. But it also is an opportunity because you can advocate for the minimally invasive procedures that we do in interventional radiology and say, hey, wait a minute. This patient should have a celiac plexus block and neuro- neurolysis, or we can do a pudendal block and see if this helps this person's pain. You know, this, this patient should have an ablation, right? I mean, so those those are the opportunities. And then sitting down in the family meetings where you're having these very, you know, sort of powerful conversations of with the patient and the family and the physicians and trying to get everybody on the same page, invaluable experience for our you know, interventional fellows and, and residents. So I think now that we have some flexibility in the training, I think that's a really important part that we should be integrating into our interventional radiology residencies around the country is some exposure to palliative care and just building that building that relationship. And so we do that at UCSD. Uh, we don't necessarily have them formally rotate on palliative care, but because of 
Anthony Tadros's work and these weekly touch bases that we have, you know, we're, we're able to, we're, we're pretty connected to palliative care. And obviously with my background, you know, I sort of make it a priority. Exactly. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense to me, but I guess the two of us are preaching to the choir a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, maybe, maybe we talked about the kind of the next level. So that, that's maybe the average approach. Let's say I'm someone that really wants to make palliative interventions or palliative care part of my practice. You know, you're probably one of the best people to ask about this is how do you how do you build that? How do you acquire those skills? W would you recommend someone pursuing a palliative care hospice, you know, certification? Or do you think maybe that's overkill if you have a good relationship with palliative care? Or what, what have you felt over time? Because you've kind of, I guess, experienced both sides of it now, ha having done that and having that not done it yeah. before. So, yeah, it, you, you've hit on a, an interesting question because I'm actually right now at, you know, 10 years oh, out. Okay. So I had to make the decision of, am I going to re-up? Uh, am I going to study all that that material again to try to take the test, or am I going to embark on the lifelong learning, which they have a very parallel track to us, where you basically have to sign on for 600 questions over the next five years, and you got to get 500 of those questions correct? And I'm like, oh my god! So I said, you know what, I'm going to do it. Okay. And so for me personally, I've already invested all this time and energy, and this is something I'm truly passionate about. So I took the plunge, hopefully I won't flunk, but along the way, even if I do flunk, I'll have, I'll have re-upped and I'll have really learned a lot more and I've really refreshed my learning. And I, hopefully I'm the conduit for our society and for, for my team and for Interventional to sort of continue to make this something that people think about, Yeah. right? It, so at, that, at minimum, you know, that's me. I think the average Interventionalist who wants to take it to the next level doesn't necessarily need to do the the fellowship it's it's a big lift uh honestly but create that relationship with palliative care start you know rounding with them maybe once a month or going to their conferences you know getting invited to present at their conferences one of the cool things uh about having the fellows and the residents rotate is that they can educate the palliative care team on the procedures we do but also can go over the imaging because we we assume you know, that all of the other special specialty players understand a basic level of imaging, but you'd be surprised. You know, so our fellows are teaching them, well, this is the pulmonary nodule and that's not the pulmonary nodule. And, oh, you know, here's the chest wall metastasis and see how it's invading into the, the nerves. So there's this opportunity to really cross pollinate, which I think is, is awesome. Right. And so I think that's probably what I would recommend folks do is, uh, connect with the palliative care team. Hopefully there's a, an inpatient palliative care team where you're working and really build that relationship. And that relationship will educate you and it will also build your practice. And so it's, it's fruitful and it's, it, you'll actually learn a lot. Uh, you'll learn, like one of the things that is so powerful about the training is that you really get a handle on opioids, you know, tricyclic anti, uh, antidepressants, you know, the SSRIs and the SNRIs. I mean, all of these different medicines, rotating narcotics. So you start to have them lecture to you, you incorporate palliative care lectures in the IR curriculum at your institution or in, at your hospital. And you'll start learning some of that really important work as well. And, you know, how you help a patient come in, you know, they're on a high dose of narcotics and okay, you're not on any gabapentin. Well, maybe we should think about gabapentin, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. So so you start to get those uh, skill sets developed. Yeah, it sounds like it goes both ways that, you know, they yeah. have things to gain from us. We have things to gain from them. It just takes, you know, that first step maybe of, of reaching out and seeing, because I'm sure what that practice would look like is going to vary from institution to institution to a little bit. So trying to figure out what are, what are the resources, what are the people, what are the skills that you have and see what makes sense. And then, it, I mean, it sounds kind of like a win-win if that's something that you really want to do. Absolutely. At least Absolutely. all, all yeah. the palliative people I've ever interacted with are usually very, very game to collaborate with interventionalists. So I, I don't think there would be, you know, pushback. I'm sure that people would be welcomed with open arms if more IRs reached out. <laughs> Eric, I couldn't agree with you more. I, they, uh, I find them to be an incredibly engaging, sort of very open-minded group of people. 
and they really are thirsty to to learn what we have to offer because the minimally invasive part of it is just so relevant to most of their patient situation. Where here at UCSD, what we've done is, uh, you know, the goal is always, can we do one of these minimally invasive procedures to lower the narcotic requirements so that the patient's requirements are less, that their pain is more controlled, uh, their cognition is better, you know, all the side effects that we deal with with narcotics are moved to the background. So they're always thinking that way. So, I mean, literally they're asking us more often than not, and we'll be like, well, I don't know if that's really going to work out for this patient, but they're, they're always thinking that way. So I think you'll find them to be very receptive uh, to working together and, and problem solving together. Yeah, exactly. What about, uh, what about resources for people out there? You know, let's say that I want to yeah, I think the pain control is a great example. Let's say I want to become more familiar and more comfortable with that. Is there a way, you know, we talked about reaching out to palliative care and how that can be a resource, but is there a way that I can self-educate myself, apps, websites, stuff online, things like that? Yeah. So it's ironic, but, you know, in, in a parallel universe, um, all of our states and our government are trying to get us to be more educated on opioids, right? And prescribing opioids appropriately and uh, opioid addiction. And, and so it's all, all of that, uh, those resources are actually things that we're supposed to, to do anyway. And, you know, we, we probably blow through those slide decks uh, at our various institutions so that we can get that learning done. I but click the next button furiously. That's what... Click the next button furiously, right? So, you know, there actually is a lot of um, good data and a good, you know, um, podcasts and websites and learning modules out there on conscientious opioid prescribing relevant to palliative and hospice. You know, they, they view it from a completely different lens. They view all of this to be a barrier to patients getting adequate pain control. And so there are all of these hurdles that have been put in place in every state, you know, and if you're going to prescribe narcotics, you got to go to that website and look at how much they've been prescribed. And, you know, so there are these barriers, right? And hurdles. And, and the intent is obviously good, but we in our day-to-day -day practice realize that it's a pain. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, and because of that, and because there's this sense of the police are out there watching how much, you know, narcotic prescriptions you're writing. And if you're writing them thoughtfully, and if you're doing all this there's this concern that, hey, if I prescribe this narcotic, I'm going to be on the hook and I might get in trouble, right? And so if you're an interventionalist and you don't feel, you know, very adequately prepared and, and you're not real confident in your narcotic prescribing capabilities, you're going to shy away from that, right? Which I think is a universal problem in medicine. But, you know, I think I would run towards it and say, I need to learn as much as I can about these medications so that I can be confident in prescribing them because we do these procedures on people and there's often post-procedure pain that we need to really manage appropriately, right? Or we've failed the patient. Yeah. So a little preachy, I, you know, but, uh, you know, I, that's, that's on my mind lately is I bring a patient in, I do an ablation, am I going to adequately manage their post-procedure pain? And I, I think that's that's got to be a top priority for us as IRs. I mean, I, could, I couldn't agree more. I, I've actually heard that critique a lot that, you know, a, a downside of the attention to the opiate epidemic has been that people are under-treating pain generally. And that, you know, this doesn't apply, as you were mentioning, just to the person we were talking about with the, the terminal metastatic pancreatic cancer. This is also your ablation patient or not even interventional oncology all the time, right? I mean, all of our procedures cause some degree of pain and are you adequately doing it? And some patients have different responses to pain. I mean, it's much more complex of, a, of an issue. So I think that, I, I think it's applicable regardless, you know, if you're an interventionalist, regardless of what your practice is, even if you're not necessarily treating a whole bunch of terminally ill pain patients as we, they get labeled, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And there are resources out there, right? I'm, so, you know, I'm, I've spent most of my career in an academic institution where there is a anesthesia pain service, there is a palliative care service. So, you know, those resources are available to you. If you have a patient who comes in on high doses of narcotics and you want to do a procedure, 
you know, I would encourage everyone to sort of utilize those experts in managing the perioperative pain. And if you're out in a private practice and there are, you know, less resources potentially, there likely is at least an anesthesiologist that could help you through the use of monitored anesthesia care in the perioperative period, but then also maybe helping you as that patient is emerging from the procedure. Yeah. So using those resources is something I think we we should all be pretty mindful about. And, you know, the, the narcotic naive patient is a different discussion, you know, and that, that's in some ways easier, some ways more complicated. But that person who's on, you know, 60 milligrams of MS Cotton BID who comes in and, you know, you've had them hold their medications and they come into the procedure and all of a sudden you're giving them, you know, 0.5 and 25 of Versed and fentanyl. That's not going to cut it, right? And and their post-op medication requirements are going to be so much higher. And there's simple math to figure that out. And that's, you know, that's something you can learn with some of these education mod modules that we talked about. And that's what palliative care physicians are really pretty good at. So use your resources. Do you have any pearls that you've noticed from pain control that you feel like, you know, this is this is a mistake that I see, you know, that average interventional radiologists walk into often or something like that? Or do you feel like it's more of, you know, every person's kind of different with their pain control and it's more of that knowing what you know and being willing to ask for help virtue? <laughs> well, knowing, knowing what you know and asking for help, yes, that's probably number one. Uh, number two is, you know, if you look at the anesthesia pain literature, and uh, I borrowed this from my orthopedic experience, um, and I think that people like Brooke Spencer has published on this a little bit and some others. But when you are preparing a patient for, say, an ablation or an embolization, uh, where you're, you're going to expect some, you know, some flare pain. So either from post-embolization syndrome or post-ablation flare, you know, a layered pr approach is important. And so just thinking that the narcotics are going to do it all is, I think, a simplistic approach to managing patients' pain. And so one of the pearls that I've sort of stumbled upon and sort of incorporate, which I think a lot of others do, is Tylenol, one gram pre-op and starting them on gabapentin, maybe three to 600 milligrams, 48 to 72 hours every night before the procedure. Getting ahead of it. And getting ahead yeah. of it. Intraoperative uh, steroids, if uh, you're going to do an ablation or an embolization. So I'll often give eight to 10 milligrams of Decadron, IV, intra-op, and Toradol, mm -hmm. right? 10, 15, 30, depending of Toradol, intra-op. So you've got a layered approach, right? So you've got gabapentin, level one data for perioperative pain. You've got Tylenol, level one data, perioperative pain. You've got an anti-inflammatory COX-2 inhibitor, so Toradol. Uh, and then you've got a steroid. All of these have level one data, and they've been shown to reduce the narcotic requirements, and they also help with the nausea and, and, and sort of that, you know, perioperative symptomatology that we deal with. So that's, I think that's a pearl that I use in all my ablations. And then as they go out the, of the procedure and go home, Medrol dose pack, continuum on ibuprofen, continuum on ty Tylenol, and maybe gabapentin every night, a couple of, you know, for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty common kind of cocktail that I think if you're not doing that, should consider doing that. Yeah, I think I think that's great, even for, you know, uterine fibroid embolization, right? I mean, that's a solid organ ablation, pain, flare afterwards type thing, targeting multiple points on that pain pathway, not just, you know, snowing them, so to speak, with narcotics is probably a better way to go. Or I've also seen people um, uh, who at UCLA do like the hypogastric nerve block too beforehand yeah, on top exactly. of those things. Again, like getting ahead of the pain ahead of time. Well, and if it, 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 those types of strategies, it, you, as you were saying it, I was realizing that we hadn't touched on that, but, you know, doing a block, if you're going to do some extremity, you know, embolization or ablation, that's such a simple thing to do. And it really helps the pain control as you're emerging from the procedure. So an ankle block, if you're doing something on a foot, uh, digital blocks, um, you can do intercostal blocks and, and hypogastric blocks if you're going to do something in the pelvis, right? There's this uh, portahepatitis block that people are, are talking about uh, oh, using that. in concert. With, yeah, and so, you know, doing an anesthetic block in the, in the portahepatitis or a celiac plexus block 
if you're going to do a biliary intervention or you're going to do a, 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 a liver ablation. So these are all advanced level, but when you think about, you know, are they really that complicated? No, they're actually pretty easy. You're just sort of pairing one relatively straightforward block strategy with an intervention for a better outcome. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I think it goes back to a lot of the underlying themes that we've been talking about, about that knowing what you know, reaching out to educate yourself, reaching out to other people like the pain service, the palliative care yeah. to help, you know, really do a better job for the patient. It's almost that the thing that we're fighting against is this idea of feeling like you have to know it all and do it yourself right. sometimes, which I think sometimes we fall into in, in medicine. At least it comes up a lot when I used to interview psychoanalyze physicians for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear more about that, actually. Uh, but uh, I think that in interventional radiology, interventional oncology, we have a tough job, right? Because we want to offer all these wonderful procedures and we know that we can actually be make a real difference in patients' lives. But it's a huge spectrum of procedures. And as time goes on, you start to sort of maybe noodle about well, maybe I want to be this type of interventionalist and sort of offer this bucket of procedures and really understand these diseases as well, right? And I think we're in that evolution as a specialty where we're becoming sub subspecialized, right? So we have our liver people, we have our ablationists that do, you know, kidneys and lung and uh, liver. We have people like me that have sort of just looked at all the palliative interventional therapies and sort of like that's you know, I want to off. I will really want to focus on that. I don't do liver directed therapy anymore. I've, I've stopped doing that because I really want to be focused on MSK and spine and the palliative interventional space. So, you know, you try to control the amount of knowledge that you have to, un, you know, you have to have so that you can truly be an expert in this, you know, sort of this realm or this realm. So I think that's really important, at least for me, knowing my limitations, I sort of said, I, I'm not going to do uterine artery embolization. I, I can't be that person because I don't know enough about it anymore. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's kind of a nice uh, undertone summary of some of the themes that have been throughout our conversation. And, and I do think that there's a lot more, there's, seems like there's been a growing interest in this topic overall, interventional radiologists. Maybe I've just been noticing it more kind of at, at conferences. You know, I was talking to Dr. Sarah White at MCW about it for a while at SIO and uh, Alan Zag at SIO as well at Duke that also did grand mm -hmm. rounds for palliative care there, kind of talking about that reaching out thing uh, that we've been talking about. So seems like a lot more interest uh, in it, which I think is a I good so. thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the understanding that much of the work that we do is palliative by nature, that the actual curative things that we do as interventionalists it's probably not the majority, right? If we're really being honest. And so we're all palliative interventionalists in some respect. And so getting, you know, gaining more knowledge, getting more comfortable with that, the space, uh, connecting with the palliative uh, team. I, I think this is just, you know, a natural conclusion that those of us that, that have been doing this a long time have come to. And it rubs off on my fellows, I hope, uh, and my trainees, you know, and it's nice to see people that I work with, um, like Sarah and uh, Anthony Brown is in private practice out in Colorado who's doing a lot of this work and Anthony Tadros here at UCSD and, you know, others that have sort of gone and, and to other places and, you know, start offering these things. It just, that's one of the best parts of teaching, right? Is you sort of see that effect. Yeah, you see it grow, you know? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, what else? What, what did we, what did we miss? Uh, you know, those were, I think, all the questions I had thought about at the kind of the beginning going into it. But are there other things you feel like are really important for us to talk about or, or kind of get out there to the interventional radiology community? Maybe maybe about trainees. I know we touched on that a little bit, but there's a lot of medical students and residents that listen to this. You know, I, I think that just to kind of flip it back to the education piece, uh, one of the things that we looked at was you know, the educational program that our residents were going through and our fellows at the time when it was just the fellowship. And we asked some questions about, you know, do you feel adequately trained in an end of life conversation? Do you feel adequately trained uh, in how to counsel somebody on the fact that they're dying and that they're going to die? 
the futility discussion that you and I are passionate about, you know, do you feel adequately trained and prepared to have a conversation with a patient to say, I'm not going to do this procedure because it is not going to help you. It is, n- it is a futile procedure rather than just offering what I call expensive hope, which is something we do sometimes, That's right? That's a nice so, term. Unfortunately, we, we, we do that, right? And we do that terminal embolization or we do that terminal X, Y, or Z and the patient dies within 30 days and we we look back and go, that was probably not the right thing to do. So, you know, asking those questions and understanding as a specialty and as training programs, are we adequately preparing our future interventionalists uh, to practice this way, to, you know, to answer these questions, to consent appropriately? I, I think we should focus more energy on that. And uh, other specialties are as well. And so ER, surgical oncology, some other disciplines have really asked these questions. And because, you know, the the patient comes crashing in to your ER and you've never met them as an interventionalist often. And you're trying to make that on the fly decision of, should I do this? I'll give you a story, which I think I tell this story. Um, Mike Malowski is a vascular surgeon at MCW, great guy. uh, is very mindful of these kinds of things. He and I were on call one night and uh, we get the call that there's a ruptured AAA and we go zipping into the trauma room and it's this 86 year old woman, lovely, lovely woman. All of her mental faculties there, but she has a ruptured AAA that's going to be a very challenging one to perform a, an EVAR or even a PVAR uh, and a vascular aneurysm repair. And She's going to end up going on dialysis because it involves the renals and, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a daunting task and she's got comorbidities. And so because of my training and the experience that I've had and, and similarly with Mike uh, and how he thinks about patients and the fact that we were there as collaborating physicians, which I haven't talked about yet, but I think it's so important that the two of us were there together to provide that team-based approach and we had the, the gumption, the, the, you know, the sort of fortitude, if you will, to say to this patient and then to counsel the family, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do that EVARS and because you're never going to leave the hospital. If you do leave the hospital, you'll be on dialysis and your quality of life will be totally destroyed for the, what, whatever time you have left. Talk to the patient, talk to the family. They were totally on board with that. That made complete sense to, to them. And so, you know, we put her into the ICU and we controlled her pain and we gave her some oxygen and she passed away a couple of days later with all of her family around, you know, death with dignity. And rather than uh, go to the hybrid OR and put in that, that endograft and, you know, the patient wakes up and their kidneys don't work anymore. And, you know, and I'm painting an extreme case, but it happens. And so making sure that when you're in the heat of the moment that you have the ability to say, wait a minute, this isn't something we should do. Let's, let's not do this and let's have a good conversation with the patient and the family and see if we can convince them that this is futile, that this is not in their best interest. Yeah. Goals before so, holes. I think that's goals before holes. We started there and we're <laughs> finishing there. That's, that's perfect. Goals before holes. Yeah. No, I think that's, yeah, I love it. I think it's good. I think it's interesting for the you and Vassar surgery, right? Because I think that when I've talked to people about the futility question is people feel like they get bullied into it, even by their own partners in the sense that they say, well, I said no. And then the next day my partner's on, they ask them, they say yes. And then it gets to be this kind of, you know, physician shopping for who's going to do it. Mm-hmm that you really need that team-based approach if you're going to to do that and have that that conversation. And once you have that conversation, obviously with the patient family as your partner with that, with that shared decision, that should, that should be the decision, you know? <laughs> right. Well, exactly. And uh, if, if you've got somebody who is non-reconstructable vascular disease is one that comes up and, you know, the, the patient comes to the ED and the, it's your partner that's been seeing the patient in the outpatient realm, but you haven't had the conversation to say, if you come to the emergency room, we're not going to do this. Like, we're, And so then your partner gets screwed because that conversation in the outpatient world hasn't happened. And so now in the inpatient or in the emergency room situation, 
you're, you're t- it's tough, right? To sort of like convince the patient, well, you know, I know that we haven't talked about this at your last clinic visit, but we, we don't think we should do this. Like, so in the clinic, having those really important conversations to say the next time this happens, you know, let's be clear about what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. Yep. Biliary drainage catheters, right? The third biliary drainage catheter to try to get the bilirubin to three or four to get more so chemo. you can get the chemo. Mm-hmm. Oh mm-hmm. my gosh. You're like, you know, could we, could we solve that problem? So Helena Rockwell, who's one of our M4s here, uh, uh, super, um, and is, uh, you know, involved in your ethics, uh, project. You know, we were talking about the other day at our meeting, like, is that a project that we could tackle as a society and, or, you know, to look at as, because we are all often pressured to put that biliary drain in and we know f- full well that it is very unlikely some, you know, that that's going to get that bilirubin down so that they can get the chemo and there's even data to support it. Yep. So, you know, that's one of those classic dilemmas that we deal with. Number one example, when we, we studied an asshole bunch of interventional radiologists, you know, when you say no, what things you consider futile versus palliative. Number one example of futile interventional radiology is that. And then the, the other one was the gastrostomy tube in end stage severe dementia. Yeah. For the, the parent that, you know, they're not even verbal or verbal. And then the, it's usually the, the, uh, the kids or whatever say, you know, mom or dad isn't eating and you need to put this tube in so they can eat. Those are the two, right? <laughs> Yep, yeah, for sure. And, you know, in the palliative literature and in the palliative teaching, the gastrostomy tube in the dementia patient is a fairly clear cut. Yeah. There's guidelines, position statements from the There's Geriatric guidelines, Society. Right? Yeah. So, so again, the, the cross-pollination between our disciplines so that they can educate us on how to counsel the family and to push back on the referring physicians, if they're inappropriately asking for those things, is, you know, that's, that's there. That, that opportunity is there for us. Yeah, exactly. Well, what, any, anything else or should we, uh, should we call it, call it an afternoon or morning? Uh, yeah. A mor- <laughs> you know, uh, gosh, I think we've hit a lot of the really important topics, um, and, and, uh, some classic scenarios that come up, uh, and, you know, appropriate informed consent and not over-promising and, and sort of as a young physician or as a trainee, you being very um, thoughtful about how you portray the procedures and what they can and can't do. I think, we, I think we've hit most of it. I'm feeling good about it. I'm feeling good too. I mean, I really appreciate you, you taking the time. Uh, well, and, you know, and uh, I appreciate Backtable, you know, tackling this as a topic because I think this is actually really important. And it transcends IR. I think it's uh, something that is important for all physicians at all levels of career. So I really appreciate the opportunity to to talk with you today, Eric. And hopefully, hopefully, we'll have some impact, and it'll resonate with uh, with the listenership. I think I think it will. I'm hopeful. So awesome. So with that, we'll, we're going to conclude our, our episode. Thank you for listening to Backtable Podcast, your source for everything interventional and endovascular. Be sure to take us, check us out on any of your favorite streaming platforms, Spotify and et cetera. And you can visit the Backtable website as well for more updates. Thank you. And I'll see you around. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.